Score, the podcast. The only show taking you inside the studios of the world's most celebrated composers and musicians. Coming to you this week from Studio City. Craft Box Studios. We're inside Robert Craft Studio. This is Score the Podcast. I'm your host, Kenny Holmes, with my co host and the landlord, Thank Robert you very Kraft. Much. Um, we're here inside of Robert's studio today because our guest is not from here. She's from the East Coast and she's joining us on the West Coast. So uh, we're the inviting amazing her. Amazing composer, Tamar. Kali. Tamar Kali. Scored Mudbound. Um, and just excited to have her here. As our listeners know, we often go to the studios of the composers. But when we have an out of town guest, we use Craft Box Studios. And I'm happy to have everyone here, or most of you, I'm happy to have here. <laughs> and we're right by Jerry's Deli. Oh, boy. Just, uh, you know, if you need a. Any excuse for you, Robert to be by a deli. If you need a Reuben, uh, <laughs> that's the place to go. You can run right out and grab one. Uh, we're joined every week by our executive producer as well, Matt Schrader. Hi, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> My sound effect dropped out. Oh, okay. he's trying to... It was here we go. Silence. Sound sounds effect. like five pounds of cheese. That's nice. <laughs> Do you know, I, it's interesting. I met John Powell um, on the first day of scoring the movie Thin Red Line. Did you really? I did. He was working... We were just talking that, about this. Yeah, it, it just reminds me. He was working for Hans Zimmer. He was in Hans's uh, crew. He actually introduced himself to me, which probably is the last time John did something kind of overtly forward because he's always so shy. But he did come up and say, I'm John Powell, and we had a nice little chat. That was an amazing experience working on that score, by the way, Thin Red Line. For those of you film music fans, the Terrence Malick movie, Thin Red Line, which is an extremely interesting movie, has one of my favorite Hans Zimmer scores. Yeah, yeah. Really, everybody really loves that. Yeah, yeah. It's used in a lot of trailers too. There's that one amazing <laughs> cue. If you ever need kind of the somber, foreboding sound, doesn't he play? It's in the concert on Netflix. Oh, the, wow! The yeah, prog it's, one. Def it's definitely one part of, of that better tour. Known. I think mm -hmm. the cue is actually called the Red Line or something like that. Did, it's got a did, so is this is this your big reveal here? Because on our meeting last week, you said something about meeting Michael Jackson. Oh, it was during, during that. You're right. It was during the Thin Red Line. It was the f first time I met him. I actually met him a few times. But um, while we were working on Thin Red Line, I received a phone call that, of course, like all these stories, you always assume this is a joke call. So I was a gentleman whose voice I didn't know, his name I didn't know, saying, I have Michael Jackson for you, Mr. Kraft. <laughs> and I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> Next thing I know, it literally is Michael Jackson on the phone saying, Hey, Robert. It's not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, he'd like to come over to Fox Studios, where I was working, um, because he has an idea he'd like to discuss about Thin Red Line. And I thought, this is slightly uncomfortable, because Thin Red Line is this ponderous, very, very serious war movie. Yeah. And I thought... Gonna be starting something, gonna be starting something. <laughs> I don't know where a Michael Jackson song would fit in Thin Red Line if that's what he wanted to talk about. But of course I was interested and, and I even... And plus there must be the thought, if he asks to be in the middle of the movie, am I going to have to say, no, Michael Jackson, you can't do your right. song? Right, I don't know what to say. And, and I had, of course, so much love and respect for Michael Jackson. So the interesting thing is that the moment he called, I said... It's an interesting day to talk to you about Thin Red Line because on the Fox scoring stage, which is two buildings down from my office where I'm speaking to you, they're actually scoring the movie right now. Hans Zimmer is, is on the stage with an 80-piece orchestra with Terrence Malick, the director, and Michael said, I'll be right over. Wow. And I, I <laughs> thought, uh, what, um, okay, maybe 20 minutes later, it's almost as if he was you know nearby when he made the call of course but i put his name at the gate and two big suvs that ought to be an interesting day for the security right gate guy yeah yeah hi i'm michael jackson oh yeah come sure. on in <laughs> right you don't need a pass <laughs> so two big suvs pulled up outside fox music and uh, michael jackson came into my office he was wearing the medical face mask 
when uh-huh. he walked in. Yep. And then he took it off. And the first thing that struck me about Michael Jackson was how cool he was. He was not. I was a little nervous that he was going to be that he would be uncomfortable or awkward or shy. I remember he sat in the big comfy chair in my office, kind of stretched his leg out and uh, legs out, and said. Hey, wow, this is cool, Robert. This this is a cool office because I was in this great old Fox Music office that had a lot of fun stuff in it. And um, he just was a really relaxed guy. And I remember thinking, he's just like any other musician. I he's, know what you were thinking. Oh, this is amazing. <laughs> oh, this is amazing. <laughs> I was thinking this is amazing. Oh, this is amazing. So um, I said to Michael, why don't we just walk down to the scoring stage and – you can hear the orchestra because I really didn't know what to tell him. I didn't want to say this, this is a real stretch to have a song in this movie. So, as we walked along one of those narrow Just streets, you, on Michael Fox, Jackson, me, Michael Jackson, and two SUVs driving slowly behind us <laughs> as we went across the lot, five hundred <laughs> yards down a street, literally following us, his security and his guys, and a lot of people sticking their heads out of buildings. I'll bet it yeah. became clear. Wow. And I'm like, yeah, man, me and MJ just chilling. You know, we're <laughs> walking on a lot together. Were you pointing at people, like giving a grin, like, yeah. yeah. Hey, man, cool. Good to see you. Yeah. <laughs> no <Yeah>. photos. <laughs> no time for you today, but <laughs> we'll get back to you. We get on the stage, and I'd actually called Terrence Malick, who is notoriously shy, um, and said, I'm. this is really awkward and odd, but Michael Jackson just called. He has some ideas about Thin Red Line that he wants to talk to me or you about, and he's coming down right now. (laughs) And Terrence Malick said, really? I mean, we're in the middle of scoring. Well, I I guess, yeah, it is Michael Jackson, so sure. (laughs) It was one of the most unique meetings I've ever had because... Who who all was there? It was four of us stood on the Fox scoring stage. You, Michael Jackson... Terrence Malick and Hans Zimmer. And Hans Zimmer. The four of us stood literally kind of north, east, south, west, all in a quartet looking at each other. And the most awkward thing about it was that Michael Jackson and Terrence Malick are so socially awkward that they both were staring at their feet, sort of not knowing what to say. And Hans and I, both <laughs> not shy about talking, were, hey, man, great to see you. Hey, Michael, uh, you know Terrence. Terrence would be silent. Looking at, Hi. And, and hey, hey, Terrence, and this is, you know, Michael, the great Michael Jackson. and, and, and hey. M- Yeah, right. <laughs> hey, Terrence. And, and they, nothing got accomplished. I said, Michael, you had some ideas? Yes. Okay, but do you want mm, not right now? So nothing happened. <laughs> Here I brought them together to have this do conversation. You, do you know why Michael Jackson was interested? He in? wanted. He thought maybe Thin Red Line would be an appropriate movie for him to write an end title song. That became clear. Based on the title? I don't know whether he'd read something about it or he loved Terrence Malick or he needed the work. Maybe huh. it was a low point in his career after selling... 60 million records he was thinking i need a soundtrack for a warm movie movie, yeah Yeah. so zero happened it was utterly awkward it was the most anticlimactic thing i walked michael back to my office i put him in his one of his suvs he drove off and i called terrence malick to start to apologize. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm sorry that nothing happened. I don't think this is appropriate. I'm sure you feel the same. And he went, I don't know. Maybe he has a song. I thought, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> this is horrible. He said, it could maybe help sell my movie. I'm thinking, yeah, but like, I want to rock with you <laughs> in the in war the zone. Line. <laughs> it, it, clearly... Nothing ever happened. Michael never called back with another song. He did call back when we were making Moulin Rouge a couple of years later. Oh. I'm going to save that story. This <laughs> has been Story Time with Robert Story Kraft. Time with Robert Kraft. Thank you so much. Do you think that it might be amazing? Oh, this is amazing. Thank you so much. I think so. <laughs> By the way. Awesome. Was that story in any way three or four pounds of cheese? Sounds like five pounds of intense and amazing fun. Oh. <laughs> Oh, God, that much. <laughs> I feel like I need to walk around with you everywhere with that 
sound effect. Uh, I think so, just for it. But it was a great day. And by the way, I never thought of Michael Jackson saying because I did have a sense of him being just a dude. Which can't. I'll tell you one other thing he said. He walked in before he sat down in my office and he took off his mask. He actually looked at me and said, wow, your assistant's really cute. And I thought, <laughs> Michael Jackson? He did. He, I thought, that's like any musician walks in and kind of <laughs> says, uh, hey, yeah, nice. And, I, and then he sat down. He was just a regular guy. And, was, and then after all that, he just beat it. <laughs> he did. Well, I think on that note, thank you so much because Billie Jean <laughs> – that's not my kid. It's all I want to make oh, sure you now know. You're, now you're doing the wrong lyric thing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, uh, we have another story to come from Robert in the future about Moulin Rouge and Michael Jackson. Coming up after the break, we have our guest, Tamar Kali, who's joining us all the way from Brooklyn here in Studio City. Stick around. We will be right back. Hey, it's Match Raider. We have a last-minute addition to the show that we're really excited about, an all-new episode of The Inside Track with Dr. Sue Lantan coming up in the next break. It's called A Close-Up on Faces, so don't miss that. Also, thanks for helping us break 1,000 followers on Twitter, at Score the Podcast, and for all the ratings and reviews on Apple Podcast. It's making a difference. Keep spreading the good news. Now back to the show. Hey, we're back with the amazing Tamar... Kali. How'd I do? Is that about right? Excellent. Nailed it. Back in the studio and uh, just so excited to welcome Tamara. She is a genre-defying. Tamara scored the Oscar-nominated film Mudbound, which I remember seeing for the first time last fall and thinking, this has my vote beyond and above any other film I had seen. I really hadn't seen a movie like that. So powerful. Such, yeah, I hadn't so seen great. a movie like that all year, maybe for the last several years. Just incredible story and performances. Your score was, I'm going to get this correct, was listed as one of the top 25 scores of the 21st century, which is yeah. pretty impressive for, as I think it was your first movie score, Yes. You know, Was it really? Isn't that terrible? That's is a it, way to start the day. Is it all downhill <laughs> from here? Did you just... I <laughs> hope not. No. I went back and listened. Mm -hmm. And uh, just so interested to hear it without picture. Mm. I thought it was a really amazing experience. You mentioned something before we started talking about your family, and it's the first question I had for you, which is... You live in Brooklyn now, correct? I'm born and raised in Brooklyn. Born and raised in Brooklyn. But you said your family was from the Sea Islands? Yes, my, my, my maternal side. And that's in South Carolina? The Sea Islands, the Gullah Geechee Cultural Corridor, extends from Wilmington, North Carolina, all the way through Florida. So there are a cluster of sea islands off the coast of the country. Can you trace any of your musical influences to that well, I'm steeped in ethnocultural musical traditions, i.e. the blues, i.e. jazz, you know. I'm um, a second-generation musician through my dad, who's a bass player. Mm. Um, so that's there. And just in general, as human beings, we're a synthesis of everything we've ever seen or heard or participated in. And I'm sure those things come to bear as we're creating um, in terms of making a, a conscious decision to try to use that influence in the development of the score from Mudbound. Um, it was a chamber ensemble, so that didn't really come into play, except for the congregational humming that I did in one aspect of the score. Is that something that's specifically Gullah? That that's kind of humming? That's something that's specifically tradition of African American spirituals, sure. gospel, just yeah. you know the that American music form. Yeah, I, I just thought it was interesting to to see how that might have influenced the feeling of Mudbound. I also think the chamber ensemble is a really interesting choice because you feel the musicians. It's not an orchestra mm. that's covering up a lot of the humanity of the music. Mm -hmm. you f I felt it. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, there was like, at times, one strings player. Was that the approach? to the? Because it was a period piece. You didn't want some big orchestral. It, it was You're kind of just like having a moment with a musician almost. I mean, the director had a very clear aesthetic deries and, you know, basically it, it was something that was paralleling the experience in the movie where it's a very raw, emotional, um, you know, 
there's no masking happening in the film itself, and so she wanted the score to reflect that. So this intimacy and this dark, ominous um, quality, but also very uh, environmental in terms of the mud, Felt the, the rain, mud. so the emotional yep. weight, and then the physicality of the spaces that they occupied as well, reflected in the score. So this was your first film, and did I read correctly that you only had five and a half weeks to score the film? We're like four and a half. Four and a half. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> It w was that nerve-wracking to you to jump into a, a brand new world and have that much time to do it? That's Absolutely. I'm still rocking my Mudbound um, haircut because I had a full head of hair before. Uh, you <laughs> but, then, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, the thing about it, though, with that being my first score, I'm just so grateful that I was able to have this rapport with the director and have this investment in the project. I was really moved by so many aspects of it. Those The performances are so strong from the actors. The screenplay was great. Um, the, the story was compelling. And then every other person on the team brought their A game. There was just so much authenticity, integrity, love, commitment. So um, if you're going to be in a situation where you have four and a half weeks to deliver something, that's the type of environment you want to be in. I love in. hearing that description of it. And it's, as you know, that's rare to have everyone bring their A game, to have everyone be committed in that way. Um, tell us, I'm curious, how D. Reese found you, trusted you with, hey, I know you can do this even though you've never done it before. That's mm -hmm. a tremendous leap for many directors, not mm -hmm. only picking a composer, but usually they say, well, you've scored seven other big superhero movies. You can do my, mine is number eight. Can mm -hmm. you tell us how you met D? And when you first saw the film, did you panic or say, got it? <laughs> I know what to do, yeah. <laughs> well, I met Dee um, when she was shooting her first feature, Pariah. You were in it? Yeah. Yep. Um, so the producers approached me about lending music to the soundtrack. Mm. You know, um, she knew she wanted a soundtrack or, and just diegetic mu um, music for the film. Mm -hmm. And um, I had been asked to be involved in film projects before, but, you know, it's one of those things where you're like, okay but you don't know what it's going to be and you're just terrified and you're so you're like okay just you know let me do you have something i can watch da, 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 da. and i was like please let this be good please let this be good <laughs> and um <laughs> because i really liked the vibe of the producer and you know i liked you know d's energy when we met and i was like i really hope it's good and it was like devastatingly wonder like amazing was, did it have music when you first saw it temp music or well was it, it wasn't this wasn't even for a score it had it had you know she used a lot of source music in mm. it but the story was just like oh my god so i saw the short and i was like absolutely anything you want <laughs> i'm down so um i i um lent some songs and then she was like well would you want a cameo in the film and perform live in the film with your band <laughs> yeah and i was like sure and then it was like well you know i would love if you could do another take on this song by the gossip for the end credits would you do that and we can put that on and i was like yeah let's nah, do it you know i'm, I'm good <laughs> and um Best you know ditto. yeah exactly and so being on the set it, everything and then bradford young was her cinematographer and he's the person who suggested that she check my workout. So um, it was just had this wonderful family vibe and it was just beautiful. And so from there, she became more familiar with my work, um, my string ensemble. Mm. And um, because I, at that time I was performing in three different formats in terms of my personal compositions that I performed, um, Psycho Chamber Ensemble, which is an all-female string sextet, um, my five-piece, just straight-ahead, aggressive, melodic rock band, and then something that kind of bridged the two with things I was composing for piano called pseudo-acoustic. So she became more familiar with my work and um, also some historical work that I was doing. My family has a juke joint down south and like mm -hmm. I occasionally sing blue, the blues for my elders and you know do educational um, performances and stuff like that. And she saw this New Year's gig I did um, uh, with doing like juke joint uh, classics and vintage blues. So she said to me, you know, I'm working on a biopic about Bessie Smith. And mm. I would love to get you involved. And mm -hmm. I was like, you know, anything, sis, whatever you want, you know. And so she actually wanted me to score that. But because I had um, yet to have a reel or anything like that under my belt, HBO declined. 
Yeah. Um, and so I sang on the soundtrack. Mm. And then when this next project came about, she was determined to have me on Mudbound, and she did what she needed to do to put herself in a position to make to call those types of shots. And that's how we ended up working together. That's beautiful. It's so nice, and it's so great when a director champions your work. I mean, that's really what it takes because we've all seen where a director comes in with the composer and the studio shoots it down saying mm -hmm. wrong or we have other ideas or more commercial ideas. You touched on something that I find interesting as a musician and your other musical endeavors. Of course, one would never s assume that a composer of a major motion picture also has a background in Afropunk. Are you still committed to that? It, in the three bands that you mentioned, mm -hmm. I didn't hear, you said it's a modern. I said aggressive melodic rock. Is, so Would that be a punk band? Well, there's some distinctions to be sure. made. Um, the documentary Afropunk was simply a documentary that documented the lives of black kids in the punk rock and hardcore scenes. Right. So what happens a lot of times, like when you're looking at something a decade later, people think that what they saw was a scene called Afropunk, but they saw black kids in their perspective, punk rock and hardcore scenes. Yeah. Um, now, after that, because there became because we developed this network through the the film, the film. Um, so there were more opportunities for POC, kids of color, to come together and do shows because we found out about more of ourselves. It was still in the context of the punk rock and hardcore scene. Um, and so, and now the Afropunk Festival mm -hmm. is pretty much an umbrella catch-all lifestyle brand for just non-stereotypical black acts. It's, it's not steeped in hardcore punk rock, but the film speaks to that yeah. experience for the, specifically. For the listeners, can you explain what Afropunk, it, the movement is, or what that is? Afropunk was a documentary. Now, the festival is a commercial festival that highlights artists who are black who are doing non-stereotypical music. So anything from Janelle Monet to SZA, to Saul Williams to D'Angelo. So that's mm. separate and apart from the film that specifically highlighted the lives of black kids in hardcore and punk rock. It's interesting, and those four artists that you mentioned are arguably very close to mainstream now. Exactly. Or, or I mean, that's, I'm being, I'm mincing words. They're Absolutely. mainstream. I mean, D'Angelo on Saturday Night Live and Janelle Monet having Absolutely. a fabulous, huge new release. Saul Williams still preserves a little bit of a kind of indie mm -hmm. vibe. And essentially, none of those names are punk rock artists. Yeah. But, and that's why that's, there's a distinction between the film and then what came after and what the festival represents in general, which is a, an overall, a, a very far-reaching umbrella that embraces people who are not stereotypically working in whatever hip-hop or contemporary adult R&B. Did that translate easy for you? Because you're coming from the, the rock background. <laughs> background, and then you go into scoring a film, which is traditionally and, mm -hmm. and more often orchestral. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that a comfortable world for you, or did you kind of have is, to challenge yourself? It is because my personal experience, I came to punk rock as a Catholic schoolgirl who was a choral classical singer. Oh, wow. Of course. So... <laughs> the natural transition. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, and also being a second generation musician. So even, you know, I I feel like I found my independence in punk rock and hardcore. That's what being a part of that scene gave me. But I think there's always an assumption that people who are in a scene or go to punk rock and hardcore shows, that that's the extent of their existence. You know, you've got lawyers, doctors, like classically trained uh, musicians in that space, you know what I mean? And so my personal work is an extension of all my influences. Because I enjoy punk rock or hardcore, does it mean that that's the limitation of my expression? You know? And I mean, Catholic school armed me with the art of resistance. I developed Love the art of resistance in that, in that parochial, you know, religious institutional schooling setting. So um, coming to punk and hardcore at that time 
was great because I was having all these questions about my identity um, as a woman, as someone descended from people who were brought here in chains, you know, and you have a lot of emotions when you start having these philosophical, you know, questions. And um, so it was a great outlet for me to express some of the angst and the emotions that I was going through as I was asking these questions, which it is for a, a lot of people. Um, it's interesting because punk is a very varied scene. A lot of people think of the quintessential drunk punk, but there are a lot of, mm-hmm. um, pol- there's a lot of political punk when you think about minor threat, dead Kennedys, just people who were asking mm-hmm. really great questions about authority and institutions and you know and so that was the vein that I was most involved with the part that engaged critical thinking and so it made sense for me coming from the the church schooling and and that Mm -hmm. and then was that sort of a rebellion or was was your family on board with what the the (laughs) route you were taking see and so I don't I don't contextualize it as rebellion because um for me that's why I say the art of resistance um and engaging critical thought you know like why am I doing this why do we do this what is the history of the Catholic Church you know I was one of those seekers those questioning people and I wonder if that impacts or will impact your approach to film scoring some of the because film scoring you have to tell someone else's story mm. musically, um, but obviously the great composers bring their story to it in a nice, mm-hmm. subtle way. You, they're expressing themselves. Matt, do we have a little clip? I I picked that song "Boot" to play. Wow! Um, yeah, is you singing and playing? playing? I think it's a hit. <laughs> it should be. What's amazing is how contemporary it feels right now. Mm. Literally, you could drop the needle on that and have all the Spotify tweens say, Ooh, who's that? <laughs> what was the name of the band? That's me, Tamar Kali. So it's just under your name? Mm-hmm. Because it makes me think, uh, maybe I should listen to it a little bit. <laughs> That's the first time I've heard you say tween, by the way. Well, tween is, you know, <laughs> it's one of my... One of my go-to words. <laughs> That's how you search all your music. What are the tweens <laughs> oh, wow. listening? What's hip tween with playlist? Tween? Wow. What's the, what are the tween <laughs> playlists? <laughs> wow. Um, we're going to take a quick break. Coming up, we're going to talk to Tamar about Come Sunday and also Between Earth and Sky, which we just heard about. Uh, stay with us. Much more to come on Score the Podcast. The Inside Track with music psychologist Dr. Sulan Tan. Someday you'll understand that. Ah, no. He's looking at you, kid. Many iconic moments in cinema focus on faces, allowing us to gaze deep into the eyes and examine every emotional nuance. Close-up shots of faces allow us to see or sense what's underneath the surface of what characters say and do and can be powerful for expressing a character's innermost feelings, as well as stirring up our own emotions. In one scene in Casablanca, for instance, we gaze at Ingrid Bergman's face for almost half a minute, without cutting away even once, as Sam sings this song. You must remember this A kiss is just a kiss A sigh is just a sigh things apply as time goes by and when two lovers woo they still say I love you music can play an important role in communicating what a character may be thinking or feeling especially during a lingering close-up shot of the face in a research study I conducted with my colleagues Matthew Spackman and Matthew Bezdek We played four short film scenes, each including a close-up shot of a film character's face, displaying a neutral facial expression. Since other researchers had already studied the effects of music presented at the same time as a character, we added music only to the beginning of the scenes, during establishing shots showing exteriors of buildings and ending before the close-ups of the faces were shown. Each participant saw these scenes with music that had been shown in previous studies to convey different emotions. For instance, this music conveyed 
happiness. This music conveyed sadness. And this was used to convey fear. We found that most people interpreted the character's emotions in ways that were consistent with the emotion of the music. In other words, viewers interpreted the same facial expressions as being happy, sad, or fearful depending on the emotion conveyed by the music. Even though most of the music was played before the character entered the scene and the music stopped before the close-up of the face was shown. More surprisingly, we repeated the study, but this time we added music only after the close-up of the face was shown and the character was leaving the scene. Again, characters were perceived as being happy, sad, or fearful, depending on the music track that played after the close-up of the face. To close with a classic example, Norma Desmond's final words in the film Sunset Boulevard are quite bright and optimistic. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. It's the music that plays after her face blurs and the scene fades to black that clues us in on the actual ominous mood of this closing scene. Scores don't accompany an entire film. The music comes in and out only intermittently. Our study suggests that the effects of music can linger and may work forwards and backwards, at times influencing what we're just about to see next or resolving what we've already seen but are still in the course of processing, and thus possibly coloring what we see or think we see in a face. Dr. Su Lan Tan is a leading researcher in the study of film music and the author of many books, including her latest, Psychology of Music, From Sound to Significance, available now at score-movie.com slash podcast. Hey, we're back with Tamar Kali, an amazing musician and composer and performer, uh, learning so much about both her background and Maybe we'll talk a little about your future because I know you have yeah. a picture coming up on Netflix, which I saw come Sunday. D is it out? I believe it's it is. Yes, out. it came yep. out April 13th in theaters in New York and LA and streaming. I would say a name that's harder to pronounce than Tamar Kali, which I can now pronounce, is the. How would you pronounce the lead actor in that? She would tell it you for. Oh, that's so <laughs> musical. And a very different score than Mudbound. And, and I actually felt a lot less score, and I kind of missed it. I sort of, really? I thought maybe you could, I know it's a little late <laughs> now that it's out, <laughs> but um, I am such a fan of the whole arena of spotting the film and well-spotted mm -hmm. films as opposed to, because I think after so many years being around film music, there's a moment in a movie and a moment in a narrative where I go, okay, downbeat. And when it doesn't happen, I think, mm. oh, it's going to come later. They're going to fake me out. When it doesn't happen at all and the scene ends, I think, um, why didn't they score that scene? Mm -hmm. And there were just a couple moments and come Sunday, I thought, this music's so wonderful. 
who do I call? Is it like a one eight hundred number? Goodness. More, more to mark. One eight hundred more score. More, I like that. One eight hundred more score. There's my new T-shirt. We That's had one the, from last we're, week. We're gonna claim that. One eight hundred more score. <laughs> Dial score the podcast. Um, but I thought it was a very interesting. Do you, did you get the gig from Mudbound? It was a separate yes. relationship with the well, director. Um, Joshua Marston and I had a conversation, and my name got put in the hat based on the Mudbound work, and uh, uh, the music supervisor, I guess, uh, um, had thought about me for this job as well. Mm. And so he and I uh, had a nice little Skype meeting, and we were a good match. And I was familiar with his work, um, Maria Full of Grace. Great, so, beautiful So, you know, movie. going into the meeting, I was, I was anxious and wondering what this, you know, what might be possible <clears throat> and I had screened the film with no temp mm. and um, you know the performances were really strong again um, Martin Sheen she would tell yeah. and Lakeith Stanfield and I was thinking to myself this is a really powerful quiet film but there was there's a, there was a sense of how silence is used in the film and quiet because there's a lot of internal action happening mm. so um, you know I felt like it was a good match, and, and because of the emotional underpinnings of the story, that I would be able to bring something to this project, because that's kind of where I come from in my compositional approach. Can you talk a little bit about uh, Between Earth and Sky, and what, what have you seen anything on the project yet? Got nothing for you. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Um, you know, we it's, can make it's stuff very, up. It's, it's, a, it's very fresh, brand spanking new, hot off the presses type of news. And um, so, you know, things will be developing. After it's a this. horror film? I, I would type it as a psychological thriller slash family drama. Okay. With some uh, family elements thrown in to be kind of children friendly. I only say it's a... It, no. no. <laughs> right, okay. No. You think you know, but you have no oh, idea. Oh, God. But I think it's going to be really good. <laughs> yes. You know, I'm, I'm about to embark on the journey. You know, Fabulous. but we're definitely in the pre stages where gotcha. before. And I'm sure that now that it's your third film, your budget must be expansive. They've st asked you, <laughs> would you mind scoring at <laughs> Abbey Road with the London Philharmonic? Well, seeing Isn't as that that you works? landed on the heli with the helicopter on the roof, right? yeah, I would say. <laughs> Wow. And those two, is that security just standing outside the studio? Just listeners' <laughs> lives. <laughs> security, and I really like your, just the whole crew you, you bring, you travel with. It's kind of nice. I rolled in 20 deep with That's an it. entourage. Uh, right? I believe me. I've been there. You talked about collaborating, and I, I wanted to touch on a little bit of a throwback, though. One of my favorite albums that you make a cameo in, AT Aliens. Oh. Um, I think, we, do we have a cue from that, Matt? Uh, yeah. Decatur song? Going way back. You ain't got to worry about your partner getting caught like a lamb. It won't be over to that big girl from the Decatur It won't be over to that big girl from the Decatur This, oh man, this album. I think I melted it in the CD player. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you connected with Outkast? <laughs> that was awesome. Um, I almost moved to Atlanta. I was so turned out <laughs> by all the creativity and the open expression. So um, my f all time favorite band is Fishbone. And um, in the 90s, they signed to Dallas Austin's Rowdy Records. And at that time, I had become friendly with them. And um, the drummer, Philip Fisher, introduced me to a woman named Joy, who I was familiar with because she was on the Rowdy label. Um, she had this album called The Pendulum Vibe. And it had gotten a little, like, one of the videos got MTV play. And I remember sitting and seeing this sister come on TV doing this, like, really trippy experimental music. And I was like, who is that? Oh, my goodness. And so Fish introduced told her about me and what I was doing. I was running this post-hardcore band called Song of Seven in New York. And so we ended up meeting at a Fishbone show. And she was saying, hey, you know, I'm really digging your style and your vibe. And Organized Noise is looking to put together a female rock group called Heroin. Would you be interested in trying out? And so basically they flew me down to Atlanta. Um, we worked with Sleepy Brown. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we, we, we wrote this track together called Can I Lick Your Funky Emotions? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, it was just a really cool experience. And at the time, we were at the studio, DARP, and 
um, Outcasts were recording their AT Aliens. And so they were like, do you want to, you know, do and I was like, oh, yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how that happened. Um, so I didn't end up going the 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 rock girl group um, route, but I made some lasting um, relationships, particularly with Joy, who I ended up um, doing support vocals, going on tour with her when she mm. toured with um, Fishbone, De La Soul, and Goody Mob. I think it's uh, time to take a quick break, and then when we come back. Are we going to do it? I think we're going to play it. Is she prepared for the excitement? Is anyone ever prepared? Are you prepared for the excitement of this? We <laughs> we have a game on this show, which we try not to make fun of, but we always do. And all the composers get nervous, and it's called... Name, Name that, that score. score. We'll be right back. I'm going to fail miserably. <laughs> this is terrible. Hey, Matt Schrader here, director of Score, of film music documentary. For the latest news from the film music world... Follow us on Facebook. Just search Score a Film Music Documentary. Or let us know who you want to hear next on the show on Twitter, at Score the Podcast. Welcome back to Score the Podcast. We're here in, what do you call this? Craft? Craft box. Arts and craft? Yeah, craft services. <laughs> craft <laughs> services. <laughs> We're here in Robert Kraft's studio this week because Tamar Kali, our guest, is joining us from the East Coast, came all the way out here just for this. I'm sure that's not true, but um, we thank you for joining us. And now, the buildup, it's... <laughs> it's the most exciting she's time She's freaking out during week. the break, and uh, we're trying to calm her down. It was interesting, because she said, I can't wait to play that game, <laughs> name that score. <laughs> she said, I probably am going to win every prize I available. envy your imagination. <laughs> thank you. And there is a chance for the audience to win. Let's play the game. Get ready to play Name That Score! The film music game where a perfect score means you, yes you, could be a winner! Now let's play Name That Score! I don't know if I uh, appreciate all of the uh, making fun of the theme, you guys. I, I think, again, pretty tastefully done. I think it's uh, deep. Pretty uh, I think it soulful, is. even, maybe. The announcer is really <laughs> it's a little just... avant-garde for me. but <laughs> All right. So uh, the way that this uh, game works is we play five famous, usually film scores in reverse. Today we're doing some famous movie songs um, from the past, from fairly recognizable movies, some Disney, some animated, some live action, a little bit of everything. Mm. Um, basically, the way this works is we play a couple things in reverse. We give you three multiple choice answers. Uh, Robert, Kenny, and Tamar Cowley will in all... In reverse. In, in reverse. Just a, a, like a, a little sequence. Um, the last question that we have is worth double. If anybody gets all of our questions right, we give away a prize on our Twitter account at score the podcast. Just mention hashtag name that score. And uh, today's theme is movie songs, famous movie songs. So um, because some of these are very recognizable, even in a small little section. Are you going no hints? We're going to do – we have to structure this a little bit differently. Uh-oh. First off, we're, we're going to play it without giving you the multiple choice options. And anybody can get it. I, I'm just going to look for a look for a hand or something. You get double points for that oh, answer. I'm, so if I, you I'm can answer, to... if not, I'll give the uh, the multiple choice options. And uh, this is name that score we'll V two. V two. And also, as you'll no, see, I think some of these will make sense. Three names of the movies they're from. You say, "Oh, it's obvious. You can hear it." But hmm. I'll go but blind. For today, Let's go. Just it's yeah. obvious. <laughs> you can go hear hard it. You, on me. <laughs> yeah, Robert's you. getting a little cocky. <laughs> Let me play out. Uh, here's question number one. So the way that this works, just so everyone's aware, Robert and Kenny usually try to mooch off of whatever our guest says. <laughs> we, we usually, <laughs> the composing room is surprisingly, or not surprisingly, always right. You're going to see. So I usually listen to what you say and say, I'll say what she said. I'll here's what here's the first clip. I'll give you the options first. Nobody blurt it out if you know what this is. Oh, I got that one. Oh. Yeah. Kenny thinks he has it. Tamara has it. Robert? Does Robert have it? I have it. Everybody yeah, thinks have they it. have it. All right. I have it from the high hat. Since we all, we since we all have it, three? go ahead. Because I'm happy. 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 Yeah. 
Points for everybody on this. I had for a minute. I Robert's just getting love into that it. hat. <laughs> Thank you. I'm all I'm, right. Okay. Every time I hear that song now, the hat's just going to stand out. <laughs> three. Has four, that ever happened to you? You hear so- three, a song four. you've heard a million times, and then you notice one little s- layer in it, mm. and then you can't not hear just that part. Always. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, two points for everybody on that, and we're moving on to question number two. I got it. <laughs> I, I, Kenny I th- has it. I'll tell you what I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was Circle of Life. Life, yeah. I thought it was Circle of Life. I did too. Robert, you're getting away from the microphone. He was there. so, he was thinking so hard, he like leaned against the wall away from the microphone. Was I close? Are so you feeling Circle of Life? Everybody's saying Circle of Life? I'm, I'm, does it, any... It's absolutely Circle of Life. Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm 100%. <laughs> Points for everybody again. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. See? So, uh, okay. I'm feeling very confident now. My confidence. <laughs> this is might gone. be a setup, though. <laughs> these <laughs> these right. get a little. Then they start it's the long money. con. <laughs> right. Matt gets sneaky sometimes. Yeah. So okay. Here comes the death <laughs> he, charge. That Grinch face starts happening. Yeah. All right. <laughs> question three. <laughs> oh man. I'm pretty sure Kenny has this. I'm stumped. I I knew who the artist was, and it took me a second, and now I know what it is. I'm agreeing with you. <laughs> <laughs> Kenny thinks he has it. Don't say it yet, Kenny. Okay. No, you have Do to Do we say want it. to hear it again? Please. Hmm. <laughs> That's my clue for you. <laughs> clap on, Kenny's clap getting... off. It's an electrical device. And this is from a don't, film. Don't say it, Kenny. Kenny, go ahead. Who wants options? I'd Give love me some options. options. All right. All right. Here's our multiple choice options. Uh, I'll play this again after I give these. Is this Lose Yourself from 8 Mile, Eminem, Men in Black from Men in Black, Will Smith, or I Believe I Can Fly? Yeah. Mark Kelly. Man, Man forget Black. me not. Mm. Yeah. The <laughs> Patrice Russian. Russian and Freddie Washington, oh. bass player. That's, yeah, that's Men in Black then. Did you know it? I, oh yeah, I heard Will Smith right away. Uh, yeah, and I, then I was like, "What? What?" And then, and then it took I was pretty sure yes. Kenny got that. All right, so Kenny's the only one that gets two points on that one. Yeah. Everybody else gets one. We're moving on to question number four, and here's the clip. Oh wow, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> Who wrote it? That's an but extra the point. original. <laughs> Who wrote the Best original? Best little whorehouse of dicks. Was it in Dolly that? Dolly Preston. Yeah, it is Dolly Parton. Parton. And it is Whitney Houston from Bodyguard. Yes. I, 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 I will always love you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Very tried, good. I tried to search that on Spotify the other day, just how you spelt it. And <laughs> I, I, I don't think I, I spelled I, it it's right. The, that's the Latin version. All right, so two points for everybody. We're moving on to uh, question five. Killing it. Uh, and this, uh, I think this one may be a little bit more difficult. So here's the clip. I know Tomorrow the, has it. I know Backwards the, or forwards, you always know that deep <laughs> vibrato. I was going to say, I know the I think, artist, but I don't, I don't know the song. I think Tamar's oh, about to yeah. pull ahead because I... That is John Legend and Common Glory. <laughs> oh, <laughs> from Marshall. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Two points. Did we, uh, no, 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 not the Marshall. Not, not from Marshall. Selma. It's from, from Selma. Thank you. Comes, Ava DuVernay. A great song. It's that vibrato. It's like reverse or forward. Yeah. <laughs> so does that mean you got them all right, even after I think all you, your worry? I think you just swept the table. <laughs> we have one one bonus question. Oh, if you see? guys are interested. Okay, let's go. I, th- I I don't think this one's maybe as as uh, difficult as a couple. So you'll probably get it, but we'll go ahead and play this one. I know that one. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's bobbing their head. Everybody knows. Uh huh. <laughs> Irene Cara. Irene Cara. Written by trivia question. Giorgio Moroder. All right. Whoa. 
<laughs> Points for everybody. So uh, let's see who who won this. Everybody got all of Our these right, but I think swept the table with we're... glory. <laughs> Oh, I did I? That puts me one of one ahead. I think so. I think so. So uh, our uh, oh, here's a drum roll. Our big winner, winners, ladies and gentlemen, won't you welcome, Ali. please? It's all of us, but to Mark <laughs> Ali, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Very, very nice. Audience. Very nice. Did can I a- ask? Did did Matt give you the answers before? You, you, just, you felt it. You I played was so it up. terrified. <laughs> She's been in films. She's an actor. <laughs> yeah, that's right. She's right. She, playing it. Uh, she I played, don't know what's I don't know coming. Anything. I don't Jeez, know anything. who knows? And yeah. then I think the dead giveaway will be when our guest says, I'm terrible at this. By the way, you guys want to just put a little money? Oh. Down? <laughs> <laughs> then you know. They know the answers. Yeah. Before we go, any films coming up or film scores that you've heard recently that the composers you find interesting i'd be curious to know who you like who you listen to mm-hmm. you maybe inf- co- composer influences yeah some work that has really touched me um um big new prisoner the double life of veronic um one something that i, I get emotional when i hear is ryuchi sakamoto um, merry christmas mr lawrence Beautiful. Um, like I drop tears. <laughs> yeah. Um, and one that's a quirky one. Quirky is good. That people wouldn't expect, but it's super iconic. Mark Lindsay, um, Shogun Assassin. Wow. From the Wolf and Cub series. Um, all that synth insanity, but you always, I could hear one of those cues and know exactly what it's from, and I might be able to spit some dialogue. I think you actually, what we did very sneakily is we got some cues for the next name that score. The next time you're on, <laughs> we're gonna play a little Shogun Assassin backwards. Oh wow! And have you knock it out? You think you could identify it? Probably. I mean, the synthesizers so crazy. You know, they're like, like you, you can just hear it. It's like it's amazing. <laughs> you know that drone, that synthesizer drone. It's. Oh, it's certain God. eras too, and certain kinds of synths just speak to a moment in time. There's the tangerine dream stuff for risky business there is the the beverly hills cop whole hmm. soundtrack ding 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 it's just my such favorite a, part it's such a sound yeah i have a way of interpreting <laughs> scores <laughs> thank you that's very and good another, i know that that's little, another cue it's a little and i pitch. wonder if people still remember which themes are for which animals from peter and the wolf because that's oh, another one well that's oh yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> who is it that one is um peter is that peter that's his theme yeah. the wolf one's it and then the good flute scary. is the little bird yeah Mm. Yeah, and the both is like, duh, 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 duh. like you yeah, know what I mean? Bang. Exactly. Oh, that's iconic. So nice. Little Prokofiev, and I learned the word motif or light motif yes. from Peter and the Wolf, which each <laughs> animal had its yes. own mm-hmm. sound, which is mm-hmm. what you do with film music. Mm-hmm. On that note, no pun, <laughs> I would like to say <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you to our fabulous guests. So interesting. I hope you'll come back and visit us. Absolutely. Maybe after you do the cool new movie you're about to do. Yeah, okay. we want to hear. called Earth and, Between the Earth and Sky. Beneath Earth and Sky. Beneath Earth and Sky. Please be come back tomorrow. Kali. Yes. Tremendous conversation. Hey, thanks to my co-host, Kenny. We do want to remind our listeners to uh, Thank you. subscribe on Apple Podcasts and make sure to rate and review if you like what you're hearing. And if you don't, eh. Just don't worry about it. <laughs> Four stars instead of five. Uh, and then, uh, again, Tamar won the game, so we are giving away a prize on our social media. Be sure to follow us at Score the Podcast and mention hashtag name that score. And for fun, give us your answers if, uh, if you feel the need to, but not required to win the prize. I am, once again, the same guy I was about four minutes ago. Before that, I'm Robert Kraft. Matt, who put together our Name That Song. We may have to have a little yeah. variation on the theme song, kind of an unplugged version, I think, for Name That Song. And Tamar Kali, our fabulous guest for today. Thanks so much. It's Score the Podcast. We'll see you next time. <laughs>